This is a Digital Music Trans episode 154 on the 17th of October 2013. This week on the show, the SFX Entertainment IPO, RDO's Space Jump exclusive, Amazon beating iTunes on price, Miley Cyrus stops the UK and US charts, and Pandora wants to see artists earn more. This week's show has been sponsored by media law firm Sheridan's at sheridans.co.uk. We thank them for their support of Digital Music Trans. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends. I'm Andrea Lianelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry. Uh, DMT is available as an audio and video show on a variety of channels including iTunes, most podcasters, YouTube, SoundCloud, Mixcloud, uh, Tuning Radio, Stitcher and Spreaker. And to get in touch with the show you can tweet us on at Digital Music Trends or uh, get in touch on contact at digitalmusictrends.com. And this week it's a real pleasure to welcome on the show three fantastic guests uh, from the US uh, starting with uh, Steve Rani who joins us for the first time so hey steve how's things all good everything is good nice to uh, nice to join you guys i'm looking forward to it and uh, steve is well known for being the manager of uh, the band incubus uh, with uh, uh, but also he's uh, very well known uh, in the music industry for his uh, music business interviews on ranmanmb.com so it's uh, highly recommended you should check that out uh, and uh, joining me for the first time as well is uh, David Downs, a freelance uh, tech and music journalist uh, who has written for many publications including Billboard, Rolling Stone, New York Times and more. So hi David and uh, thanks for joining me. How's it going? I'm great, Andrea. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. It's great. It's awesome to have you. And uh, for the video viewers, we're going to have a nice uh, thumbnail of you because uh, uh, unfortunately Skype hasn't enabled uh, uh, group chat on uh, video chat on uh, uh, iOS devices yet. So that's a bit of a uh, pain uh, from Microsoft there. And uh, uh, joining us once again, it's a real pleasure to welcome ba- back Elliot van Buskirk from Evolver FM, which is a uh, powered uh, slash part of the Econest. So hi, Elliot, and uh, uh, great to have you on. How's it going? Thanks. Um, it's going great. Going great. And going thanks, great thanks for joining us. So, so uh, you guys, uh, you are in New York, right? Me? Oh, sorry, uh, you're Providence, you said, somewhere. Yes, yeah. I'm in Providence today. Yeah. I work sort of, all, I have a folding bicycle and I'm always on the train, so right. I'm kind of between places And David, a lot. you're in San Francisco? That's correct. Oh, it's cool. gorgeous here today. Great. And Steve, where, where are you from today? Sunny California, Los nice. Angeles. Lovely, excellent. So it's, uh, it's a nice spread there. Uh, and so uh, this week I want to st- start by talking about a story that I kind of avoided on the show uh, for the past couple of weeks because, uh, uh, I don't know, it just felt a very U- US... Uh, based story, so it would m- have made sense to wait for a week like this to actually talk about it. And it's uh, uh, talking about the IPO of uh, SFX Entertainment. Uh, and so uh, what happened is, uh, you know, SFX Entertainment uh, debuted on Nasdaq last week and became the first uh, public company built on EDM. So uh, I decided to talk about it uh, uh, this week, of course, uh, due to the fact that we have an all US panel. And so, uh, first of all, a bit of a history of uh, SFX Entertainment. It's a bit of a strange company. It was founded by entrepreneur Robert FX Sillerman in the 90s. It grew until it was acquired by Clear Channel, and then uh, that was in 2000, and then it was spun off to become uh, the giant that is Live Nation today. So that's a kind of a weird history. I didn't even know that, uh, to be honest. So in 2012, Sillerman decided to uh, restart the SFX brand by creating a new company that was based on a EDM, given the boom of, uh, of the genre. And so uh, that's where SFX comes from now. It owns uh, Dutch promoter <coughs> IDNT, nightclubs in Miami, and most famously Beatport. The stock didn't do that great, but it didn't even tank completely. So it's kind of like a Mid ground started at thirteen dollars and it's now eleven forty four, so it's an interesting company. Like I'm quite excited about the prospect of something like this happening, but I'm wondering if there are any other companies that can do this and uh, and uh, whether this is going to be a trend in music to raise uh, more funds to uh, IPO or music companies. So, uh, uh, Steve, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, how do you feel about this uh, music IPO? Uh, well, this is not the first time, as you noted, that uh, yeah. Bob Sillerman has done this, and Bob Sillerman. Um, has a knack for bundling together happening things and taking them public. Um, he also has a track record of exiting shortly thereafter, uh, <laughs> which um, would suggest to some that um, his love of EDM uh, is maybe more just a love of cash. And uh, he... Um, you know, and, and it's interesting for me because if you look at Live Nation as a stock play, it's been not a great stock play at all because the concert business, you know, across every genre is notoriously difficult. Um, and for me, I certainly understand how everybody's talking about EDM now, but it feels very faddish for me. This is not like we're selling something that people need. Yeah. Um, and it would be like 
if you can start genrefying the concert business and taking it public, um, that would be that would be some really epic ground. But my guess is Bob Silliman once again will prove that he knows how to take care of Bob Silliman and he can give a fuck about EDM. <laughs> right. <Yeah. laughs> David, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, do you feel like this is just a, a kind of a moment in time where EDM is doing very well, but that might not be the case uh, for a stock play in two or three years' time? I definitely see people like Bob and Live Nation have dollar signs in their eyes for making money off EDM. Right. Uh, the IPO component is really startling to me. I talk to electronic musicians all the time, writing for the San Francisco Examiner, you know, doing previews before they come to town. And my general impression is that, you know, ideologically, EDM is totally opposed to like big banks and, and global trade, for lack of a better word. I mean, we got bankers banking on this music that is pretty much ideologically opposed to their worldview. It's like I, I, I keep wanting to say this is the moment that EDM is jumping the shark. But it's more actually going the way of rock, where right. um, that countercultural spirit is being co-opted by the the main, most mainstream of mainstream. I mean, hedge funds and sharks, people that are capable of pumping and dumping EDM, literally. And um, and I, I think um, I think there's a I think you got to respect that um, incongruency there between the basic ideology of these performers and and the artists or and the and the, and the listeners they attract. And these investors, I mean, um, these are pretty crunchy, hippie people who don't like what's been happening with regards to the banks and the financial sector. I mean, talk to Base Nectar or any of them, really. They're, um, and it'll be interesting to see how comfortable they are uh, or if they care about who they're getting in bed with vis-a-vis -vis yeah. SFX. Absolutely. Uh, Elliot, uh, what are your views on this? And also in light of the recent acquisition that they uh, made uh, of uh, the Totem One Love Group, uh, which promotes the Stereosonic Festival for 75 million. So a big acquisition right the week after they IPO'd. Yeah, um, I think these have all been very, very good points here. Um, and I saw it, the question raised online last week, you know, have we reached peak EDM, <laughs> um, which I thought was a funny way to look at it, you know, and, and, uh, and it's also the way that, you know, it's a financial way to look at it, which is, which is kind of interesting as if there's an EDM bubble or something. Um, so I guess part of the question is how big is EDM and how much is it here to stay? I, you know, I right. read another article where um, the, the Las Vegas casinos are starting to think they can make more money um, from running these mega clubs in Vegas you know, that are destination nightclubs that people will fly from all over the world to go see uh, certain DJs. They think they might be able to make money, more money from that than gambling um, in the years <laughs> to come. So that's a lot. That sounds to me like a lot of money. I know I've, I've lost some blackjack hands in Vegas. I mean, uh, if they can do better than that, then um, this could be a pretty big market. And, and in that case, you know, a vertical play like this, or, or I guess horizontal, where they're assembling, you know, a um, you know, venues, um, Beatport, this festival, um, who knows what else they'll acquire, but um, it seems like sort of a general EDM play, and, and if this thing really is going to be bigger than gambling, then uh, it's hard to see how it doesn't make sense. Yeah, and, and it feels like uh, as much as EDM is started as this countercultural thing, uh, if somebody waves 150 grand or 200 grand or 250 grand in front of a DJ, there's going to be very few people that are going to turn it down, so... Uh. <laughs> yeah, and I Bang. think it's... <laughs> if I could just add one, add one more thing about the poli political yeah, sure. thing. I mean, um, it's also unclear, you know, a lot of, you know, I interviewed uh, Dead Mouse one time and he performs in a mask and, and it's hard to imagine. I think there's, it's a difference, you know, in the rock, like Woodstock or something where, there, where there's somebody literally sitting there with a microphone and there are times when there's no music going between the songs and they can say political things. Yeah. I don't know if, um, if the kind of, if there is sort of an incongruence there, It'll, if it'll find a means of expression from the stage. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Um, but we're going to see what, what, they, we're gonna, what they're going to get up to in the next uh, few months. I mean, they've done a massive acquisition in the first week, so we're going to see how they spend the rest of the $260 million they raised through the IPO. And uh, uh, this week's uh, streaming debate prize goes to David Byrne. So uh, it's kind of a, like a jackpot lottery these days. Uh, the Talking Heads musician and, and great writer, and I, I loved his book, uh, How Music Works, uh, weighed in on uh, the streaming debate uh, on The Guardian in an uh, open editorial by presenting his points of view uh, on uh, what 
is really a difficult <laughs> issue. So uh, we've uh, talked about streaming a lot on the show, uh, but he kind of summarizes some of the points that were often made by musicians. So uh, A, streaming services for him, including Pandora and Spotify, are not generating meaningful revenues for artists. B, somebody somewhere is making a lot of money, uh, whether it's labels or investors on streaming and artists aren't. Uh, you know, C, the discovery argument seems fake to him because he thinks that people go on Spotify to look up music that they've read about or heard of from friends, not to actually find music on the service. And, uh, uh, you know, he remarks that this model, including the one of Netflix for video, for him doesn't work and is unsustainable in the long term. So, uh, of course, the, the problem is that he doesn't actually, like other musicians that have uh, talked about the debate, he doesn't actually provide any ideas as to what the alternative solution might be. And of course, that's hard to ask of anybody to do that because, you know, it, uh, you know we're not... Uh, you know, it's difficult. There are like some of the best business minds in the world are, are looking at doing this, and, and nobody's come up with a real solution. So, uh, I want to hear your thoughts, guys, about uh, the debate. Uh, where do you feel it is going? Is it constructive to t keep talking about it? And uh, uh, you know, are there alternatives to the problems that David Byrne has outlined, uh, uh, Elliot? Um, well, yeah, the people sure have been talking about this a lot, and I've gotten mixed up with it a little bit myself. Um, yeah. But uh, you know. I think the two fundamental things that that one could could you know lob back at burn are you know um, this is the classic technology defense, but you know the early days defense that and this is what Spotify will say too is that um, you know if you're talking about Spotify being say ten times as big as it is now, um, then what do the payments look like? So growing the pie, um, which there is that room in the global market probably. Um, to have that really happen. I mean, if everybody acts the way the Swedes do, it'd be a very interesting check from Spotify. Um, yeah. But then the other thing is changing the way the pie is sliced up. And there's really nothing to do about it for um, all the catalog music, you know, that's that's already been released. Somebody already owns it. I mean, that changes hands, but there's, you know, that's that just doesn't change. And, and it, yeah. I think he brings up a very interesting point um, that there's, you know, it doesn't say in any artist's clause, um, you know, if my copyrights are bundled together with hundreds of thousands or millions of other copyrights, and then that leverage is used to make deals that involve equity that I get a part of that, nobody's contract says that. Um, so I think he brings up a pretty interesting point there, and and uh, we, we don't, I don't think anybody knows the answer to uh, what that is. But so growing the pie and changing how it's sliced. I mean, if you're ideally, if if Spotify really takes off, you know, what what do you need the label for? You just submit right to Spotify and the other services. Um, and then, or, or what? <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in there, sure. Elliot, because here's what gets lost in the debate. And I say this as a guy who's had monumental battles with labels, okay? Uh, who's worked with artists. On the, I've worked at record labels. I've worked as a concert promoter, and I've worked as a manager. The most, the, the biggest issue in the music business has always been and continues to be how to stand out from the crowd, okay? Distribution for artists, you know, in the past, you had to go to the major labels to get your music distributed, okay? That little piece of the pie is now for everybody. Everybody can get their music distributed. So that huge roadblock, gone. The roadblock that still remains is now everybody can be on the web. Everybody can release a record. How do you stand out from the crowd? And I'll tell you how you do it. You get your music in front of as many people as possible, okay? And the argument that David Burns makes that the artists aren't getting the money, is no, there's nothing new about that. In the old days, the, except for the biggest selling artists in the world, there was no money to be made selling music. And that part hasn't changed one freaking iota. You know, so for the Burns of the world to sit there and, and do what I like to say is be a professional problem identifier, okay, and offer no solutions, it's too easy. There's the, there, it's just, it's a mindless bitch about the music business. The question of the day is if you're an artist making great music, how are you going to get that music heard? And the truth of the matter is for the most successful artists, the music business isn't just the selling of music. It's performances, it's licensing your music, it's commercial opportunities if you're a pop artist, you know. And so all of these places, Spotify being one of them, are places where people can find music. 
And, and so right now, the money that's being paid from Spotify is being paid to labels because artists like David Byrne signed to a label, okay? <laughs> okay. Now, there are artists coming out of contract that were with major labels for the bulk of their career that are now having the option of going independent, and I manage one of them. Incubus has spent six years or six records with a major label, Did the, actually completed a six-record deal. They're all independent now. And so Brandon Boyd, the singer of Incubus, is putting out a record independently, which David Byrne could do. Here's what independence means. Not the fairy tale of independence, the reality of independence. You pay for the record, every dime of it, okay? Yeah. You pay for the promotion of the record, every single dime of it. The video that you wanted to make with the director X, Y, and Z that the label would pay six or 700 grand to do, you can do that, but you get to pay for it, okay? And so the punchline is that issue of how you stand out from a crowd isn't any different today for Brandon Boy than it was in Incubus when they started off. Here's what I miss about having a major label. Muscle in the marketplace in terms of getting their music in front of all these outlets that can make a difference. Um, having the mindset to bet big up front when the outcome is not clear. Yeah. And so no matter who's putting up the money, whether it's an artist acting independently or a major label, they both have the same issue, competing for X number of slots at radio where millions of people can hear your music. And that's the part about this conversation that I get frustrated with when everybody gets up on the stump and professional problem identifiers. I want to say to David Byrne, great, you fucking have spotted the problem that a million other people have spotted. But Dave, you signed to a label. You had a big manager. You got the money from Warner Brothers. What's your bitch? Yeah. Okay? Right. If you want to do it independently, do it. But understand, the biggest issue in the business is how to be heard from ahead of the crowd. Absolutely. And uh, David, uh, what's your perspective uh, on uh, uh, this from a you know, San Francisco, uh, I guess, point of view, uh, from a technology point of view? Uh, especially yeah. when, when we're looking at a service like Daisy, for example, that is uh, placing that emphasis on curation and, and hopefully uh, helping to get more artists discovered that way. Um. I, I, I'm going to pile on with uh, Elliot and what Steve have said. Sure. I read the sort of David Byrne piece and, and sort of mentally said, oh, please. Um, I, I, in, a, in, a, in the broader picture, I, I think it really speaks to how disruptive technology has been that you have someone like David Byrne, who was a cultural force and is a cultural force for disruption in his day. Um, you know, part of a, you know, part of artists who, you know, like when rock came out, it was supposed to be the downfall of all culture. Um, and now, now these these same artists who were were uh, labeled as um, you know uh, iconoclasts are saying that t the technology is now the downfall of all culture. Um, I just I, I hear Bob Lefsetz in my head talking about how technology has replaced art or, or rock and culture as as the new rebel as the as the new um, independent mover. Uh, it's just hilarious to hear these uh, older this older guard treat technology the way their parents treated rock which is like oh geez what what's going to happen to you know the quality of it all and and the appreciation of it all and um and you know to to so secondly like no parent ever goes oh i hope my daughter marries a we're performing musician it's it's never been this thing this guaranteed uh treadmill to success um and it never will be arguably and um and uh, I just, it's, to, to pile on a little bit, you know, um, it is the early days of Spotify. Um, revenues are going to go up. They're going to be real, reallocated. It's going to be much more than sales. I mean, you got corporations sponsoring entire albums now. We're, we seem to be returning to the days of the 20s and 30s where it's going to be like the Beatles brought to you by Colgate, whether you like that or not. And more importantly, music is easier and cheaper to produce than ever. Uh, I don't know how long it took to write combination Pizza Hut and Taco Bell, but I'm pretty sure the ROI on that was pretty high. <laughs> well, right. you know, I think to an extent we, you know, we get what we pay for this. I mean, we get what we pay for. We get what we what we want somehow, and I think what we want from music, we as a culture, is what the Fox says, and which is just. I mean, I guess I guess this is a little bit of a sidebar here, but um, you brought up the Pizza Hut song. I, you know, I, I think there's. There are interesting cultural forces at work, and right now, you know, we've got 
the blog is the blog worthiness of something, and I say this as a blogger, but you know, you know when something's blog worthy that that what the foxes video that was like a perfect storm. Like that's what the internet wants from music, and it's not really what I want uh, from music. But I do see a positive force potentially with Spotify, and and this is something that I wish David Byrne had addressed. Um, but when you sell a CD, you need to convince somebody to buy it once. Um, yeah. When you make a bunch of money on a streaming service that song needs to have staying power. And so the Pizza Hut song uh, in a Spotify landscape would not do as well as, say, the Beatles. Um, ironically, the Beatles aren't on the streaming services. So that's a weird example. But um, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, you, you can't, you have to, the only way to do it is, is to put music out there that's timeless. I mean, that's how you get the big checks in a streaming world. So That's right. And I would just add one more thing, which is I talked to a lot of artists who say this following statement. My stuff was available for free online, and my labels wouldn't put it on Spotify. And I wasn't seeing a dime from the piracy. Now I'm getting substantial checks from Spotify and other streaming services. And my, my catalog is available to people who want to listen to all of it. And I'm happier with that than I am with rampant piracy. Yeah. That's a good one to end on, I think. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and so uh, let's move on by talking about audio. So it's a bit of an audible story, actually. Uh, I'd heard rumors about this, this like a few weeks ago, actually. I can't remember where they came from, but uh, essentially audio came out uh, this week uh, with an exclusive stream of the new Red Bull documentary on the Felix uh, Baumgartner's Space Jump. So the music streaming service is offering this two-hour documentary uh, as a free stream for people to sign up to the service. Uh, there's no credit card required. It's just that you're like a free uh, sign up to audio as a trial. Uh, the documentary is called uh, Mission to the Edge of Space. The full story behind Rebel Stratus and uh, it's kind of an art partnership because of course audio is a music streaming service so uh, why they are uh, offering access to a documentary uh, uh, on video is kind of a, an oddball especially as they have a, a sibling service called video uh, which could have probably been a better uh, a better um, oops um, a better host for that for that uh, particular uh, documentary. So it's kind of it's kind of an oddball. I mean, uh, there's lots of question marks going around on that. But uh, I'm wondering, uh, you know, what do you think the reason is, is it, why they did that? And is it is it an oddball? Here we are talking about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and and, 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 and it's had, had a bunch yeah, of shares on Facebook. Like my Facebook feed yeah. was full of shares of that. So Here, here's what's interesting to kind of dovetail that. You know, what gets once something has some value out there, everybody saw this guy jump. It was a great story. I watched it. Um, it, ha it, it has done what we just talked about. It has stood out from the crowd, right? So if any of these streaming services wanted to make a real impact and distinguish themselves from the crowd, I guarantee you there's a number that the Beatles and Pink Floyd or somebody would actually license their music to one of these services, okay? If the price was right. OK, right. so if I had just raised a bunch of money, I might go out and say, fuck it, I'm going to get the Beatles catalog right? and I'll be the only guy that can have it. Right. And that's mm -hmm. what builds values, this exclusive programming. It's what TV stations have done, P stuff that people already want to see. OK, yeah. has value versus taking something from nothing and building value. That's a whole different proposition. So, um, yeah, I sit there. I read that little story. I interesting. But. For me, the streaming audio, streaming video, it's the same thing. We're proving it right here. One guy we can see, two guys we, or we, two guys we can see, one we can't, but we're having a conversation. Right. And, and the zeros and ones, they go where you tell them. And they, they show up in the way you want them to show up. So I think these guys might be onto something, which is exclusive programming, okay, on mine, not yours. Yeah, yeah. Elliot, do you think it's a weird thing uh, to have this happen as a video for an audio service or is it as as a as steve said it's just a good business and driving traffic um i think it's part of this phenomenon i mean i agree with i agree with them it's that this thing i've been calling you know the race to be patient zero for like new desirable content i mean if you look at the way yeah. viruses spread they're you know in these movies about scientists there's always patient zero i think i might have I was recently talking about this somewhere it might have been an earlier episode here but i think it's the same concept you know they're Something appears on the internet once, right. and then copies, as we all know, um, are very easy to make, and things get streamed everywhere and reposted, and some, even images, you know, different websites will put their little brand on it, and stuff just goes everywhere. But for that one magical, you know, first moment, it's only in one place, and there really is value there. And I think, yeah, who cares if it's a movie and not a song? It's still exclusive 
um, streaming videos close to streaming audio. And ultimately, you know, RDO wants people to, to sign up for those memberships. And it's like, it's almost like a case of why not? I mean, yeah. I think it's a little bit odd that, that they didn't use it to promote video or video. How are we saying yeah, that? Video, video yeah. maybe. <laughs> uh, instead of RDO. Um, but, you know, RDO is the one that they, you know, that they did first. It's probably the one that's got more behind it. So maybe that just explains it. But I think yeah, it's a good idea. If it works, the site turns into our video and or video and radio into one. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. yeah. RV video. You know, RV video. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. There you go. The country, right. you a know? distinct lack of vowels there. Um, yeah. <laughs> David, uh, so David, uh, do, do you feel like maybe this was something like a, a bit of a callback to the fact that Red Bull is so entrenched in music with their, their music program and maybe, you know, partnering with audio made sense for the brand? Uh, uh, because it was pushed in that documentary? I, I, um, I don't know. I read this in the context of RDO trying to catch up, I believe, to Spotify and, right. and distinguish itself in this pack of subscription streaming services where um, Pandora, you know, is way out ahead and they're, they're different. But it's really hard to get people, I know even personally, to jump onto Spotify and start using it. Although once they're on and using it, it comes to dominate their life it really is a different mode of consuming music and like th there's just going to be a lot of um barriers to penetration for anybody older than i'd say 30 30 or 35 to becoming a subscription streaming music subscriber for the rest of their life um and rdo is not growing i don't see rdo growing as fast as they want to or like to i see i see this move as them flailing for lack of a better term but it's also like a, a form of necessary flailing to build their brand. Although I'm, I'm not super huge. Like I'm, I'm, I don't see clearly who they're getting out of this. I mean, are they going after the Mountain Dew crowd now, and uh, the the extreme crowd with the with the Bumgarner jump? Um, it's it's just clearly a, a marquee piece of content that they got their hands on or got a deal done on, and and they have to do more of these to try to build their brand and get more subscribers before they run out of money like all the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Hey, and at David, least they, they have big coffers, at least. Can I ask David a question? Uh, were you saying that you think that for people over 30, you don't see them being potential subscribers to services like Spotify? It's not that I don't see them. I just think it's a paradigm shift for them, especially after all the years they've spent consuming music in a different mode. Um, and, you see, and I'm, the, a, I'm that guy you're talking about, and I think no you way you're the manager of Incubus. You're not like my mother-in-law. But 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 here's the deal: you said it once. Some older folks, once they find something that works for them, they keep going back to me because they don't want to, you know, change. I go on airplanes, and when I first started, when the iPhone first came out, or the i, you know, got an iPod right first came out, yeah. it was it was younger people doing it, right? Yeah. Um, but what happens now is you get on a plane, everybody's using it. And guys like me, whose wives and kids lost the CD out of the freaking cover, you wanted the Allman Brothers and it was in somewhere else and you got picked. <laughs> this is the greatest thing that ever happened in the world. Okay, digital yeah, yeah. music, you know. I'm, I'm uh, like, I think, yeah. And Sorry. that's why I say that you, I, I think long term, for, particularly for some folks that still like to hear music, I think they get more like me where they're going, fuck the CDs. Jeez, I got it all in what used to be my cigarette case and, and yeah. nobody can fuck with it. I think it's, I think it's, that's their great hope. You know, it's, I wonder yeah, about I mean, the I've, under I've 30. Converted, I've converted my mother-in-law to Spotify and she's in Peru right now with a bunch of offline playlists having a ball. Um, fuck yeah, but that's what I'm talking about, about, right? Yeah, it I is, mean, I'm, it, I'm, I'm not convinced that the market. You sorry. know, it took like a media insider to convince her. Yeah. Right. I mean, I, I'm not I'm not convinced that the market's as segmented as people sometimes think it is. I mean, even if you, I work with um, some very incredible software engineers who went to MIT Media Lab and stuff like that, and and uh, I've worked at Wired and CNET and been all through the tech thing. Like, oftentimes working with people who aren't writers but are programmers and stuff like that. And I think my theory is that even those people don't want to deal with a bunch of. Uh, Bull crap or whatever you want to call it when they're trying to do their technology you know they, nobody wants to have to exercise the software engineer part of their brain in order to make some music play that they want right um it's like let's use those cycles somewhere else even if we have the capacity I, i'm not convinced that we want to have to do that stuff so i think it's it's like that's kind of the genius of apple and um perhaps if these streaming services can pull it off them too um of sort of realizing that even the the bleeding edge tech people want things to be 
simple. Yeah, and Alex, yes. uh, let's pick up on the demographics as well. Like you, you wrote a piece this week about uh, RDO offering a half price subscription to college students. So that's quite a new thing for the US. I don't think anybody else has done it. I know Spotify is doing it in the UK. Uh, do you think that will bring in students that might not want to spend 120 bucks a year on, uh, on a streaming service? Yeah, I mean, if you ask any, any marketing person, the, the, the person they want to market to is somebody who's about to make decisions that are going to stick with them for, the, for decades. Because then that's 120 times a higher number, right? Yeah. So yeah. college students are, I mean, I think that the bet there is a smart bet and it might still lose, but it's that um, people, you know, this is the classic saying, you know, you, at, at one point in, you have more uh, time than money, then you have more money than time. I mean, I have two kids now. I'm not going to, even if I could go to a record store, which there isn't, aren't even that many of them around in, in my neighborhood right now, um, you know, when would I do that, honestly? So uh, for me, I, I actually pay for multiple subscription services. I mean, kind of just because I want to know what, what the various ones are doing, but also because, I mean, to me, $10 a month for, you know, for that amount of music when I don't even have time to, like, do anything anyway anymore. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I, I just think that to catch people in college so that even if they don't make that decision the year they graduate, it could be 10 years later. Um, it could be a yeah. long, a long play, yeah, but I, I think, think it's smart. I think Spotify and RDO should have desks at orientation, just like right. Visa and Chase do, and uh, they should get hook them young and early, and and get deep into their lifestyle and and, and bed like ticks, and, and so they can. Oh never my be, God! Or they I should think you've bundle. Got it. I, I think they you've should got bundle. It as, uh, yeah, exactly. Say, That's what you're saying. They should get, bundle that Spotify with a six pack of beer because I haven't met a college kid yet that doesn't have beer or weed money. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Exactly. It's like ten then, bucks uh, a month somehow, is actually not that much. Somehow that comes Go straight to the administrators and be like, "Hey, can we throw in a Spotify with the year's tuition? Can we just uh, get that?" By the way, I don't think that couldn't happen. They're giving away I iPads. Tried. I have two kids that are getting ready to go to college, and and it's like, my God, it's like they're giving away stuff. We'll give you an iPad. You know, it, I think they should there. bundle it with tuition. They well, should. or with the visa, when you get that v that predatory visa card, it's like, hey, here's another reason to do it. We'll cover that other half of the RDO subscription, right? I mean, that'd be a great, yeah. great deal. Exactly. Bundle yeah. it with your college loan. You know? Yep. Yeah. Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> just, just one more thing, you know, on top of the $225,000 that you got, your end. <laughs> just pretty insane. Uh, thankfully, I, I studied in the UK before they raised the fees to whatever it is now, which is like 16 grand a year. So I was one of the lucky ones that managed to do university for only about 4,000 a year. So uh, they, could, yeah. they could treat it like an anti-piracy measure. Don't steal, <laughs> just use your Spotify account. It's free, you go to USC, come on kids. <laughs> There you go. Nice. That's, that's a good idea. Well, we'll see if it's implemented in the, in the next uh, school, back to school season. And in the second half of the show, we'll be covering Amazon being cheaper than iTunes, Miley Cyrus's chart topping album, and Pandora's CFO interview with CNET. But first, a short information piece recorded with this week's sponsor of the show, media law firm Sheridan's. Uh, it's uh, great to be here with uh, Tahir Bashir with another segment on digital service providers. So, hi Tahir, and great to have you on. Thank you for having me on the show. So, we're going to talk about uh, terms uh, today, in terms between digital service providers and uh, rights holders. So first of all, let's tackle one of the more uh, uh, common uh, issues that uh, service providers uh, encounter when doing a deal with especially a bigger uh, potential partner, but, but also smaller ones, uh, which is MFN, which is a uh, most favored nation. So uh, how do you tackle that? And, and what's the best way to really deal with that uh, inevitable uh, roadblock that, that comes up pretty much every time you try and do a deal? Yeah, so just to explain to the, the viewers and listeners, most MFN clauses are most favored nations clauses, which effectively means that whatever you agree in this particular deal with your content provider, if you agree something better with another content provider that then comes into this deal um, you know for me it's they're horrible clauses I've seen businesses actually go under as a result of MFN clauses because um, when it comes to the audit stage um, the uh, service the content owner audits sees that somebody else got better terms and then insists on those and the company doesn't have it because they've already paid the monies out yeah. so uh, for me it's lazy negotiation you know a, a rights owner should know the value of their rights at this stage um, but inevitably you know there are times when you can't get around them and they insist on them so what you need to do in those scenarios is just make sure that you've got uh, a good lawyer who is carving the actual wording um, so as not to make it too 
too wide and for it to be very specific as to what it actually attaches to. Yeah, absolutely. What are the riskier factors in terms of, do you think like rates, for example, are a precedent that can be risky for, for the startups or are there other particular nitty gritty bits that, that can be uncomfortable for them? Uh, I mean, there's lots of things that can be uncomfortable. <laughs> rates are obviously, you know, the commercial, you know, this is what we're paying out. But, territory uh, reality as well. Yeah, territories are, uh, are important. Uh, um, the way that you use the rights, bundling deals, which is, you know, all, you know, uh, you know many see as Shangri-La at this moment in time. Um, you know, being able to work, white, label ser white labeling services, all these types of terms uh, uh, tend to be... Um, yeah, tricky, but you know, particularly when you've got a service which is trying something different. Yeah. Then ultimately, what you want to try and uh, encourage the rights owner is, well, let's try this out on a trial period at least. We're not setting a precedent. Let us have a go. We will track what we do, and I think tracking is really important from a DSCP's um, perspective because if you can track your usage, track your revenue, track your return, track the kind of number of eyeballs you're getting in your service, this is really good data which then can justify your position moving forward when you're negotiating uh, for the next element. That's great. Thank you very much and until the next segment. Talking about uh, prices, uh, one of the things that came up this week was uh, uh, a, a study that uh, confirms what I, I always suspected, and everybody I think, uh, is that uh, uh, iTunes is much more expensive than Amazon. So um, uh, Deal News uh, has confirmed that uh, Amazon is cheaper than iTunes up to 84% of the time. And so this is no surprise, but consumers are still buying music in droves from iTunes. Uh, and uh, we don't really know whether it's a force of habit uh, for the demographic of who's you, you, you know, using iTunes. Uh, linked to the devices, so whether it's uh, the iPhone that's still the draw or the Apple Touch. Uh, and, you know, Amazon is trying to battle this. We've seen them launch a desktop player uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, that is Windows only for now, but it's trying to uh, compete with iTunes in order to get people to buy music from Amazon. Uh, you know, it's, it's a struggle, essentially. You know, Amazon are getting perhaps one or two percentage points, uh, you know, every, every few months when the new stats come out, but they, they're having a hard time breaking through. Do, do you think this is just... Uh, a shift that they're not going to be able to pull off or is there something they can do to really drive people away from iTunes and into the Amazon ecosystem? Uh, David, from, from your perspective, is it, is it just a case of uh, uh, systems rather than price at this point? Yeah, I mean, I think the fact that Amazon's cheaper and yet iTunes is still so dominant speaks to the fact that people will pay for integration. Right. It just works. And the people I know who are rad as Amazon hounds they combine their Apple hate with their love of deals, and, and that's really what's uh, made them endure the Amazon music ecosystem. Right. But I, when I just think of people who just want it to work and don't want to ever think it about it, that's, those are iOS users. Yeah, but the, the funny thing is that the market of you know music sales is, is quite large still, and I don't think everybody that's using iTunes has got a Mac. So a lot of people are going to be on uh, uh, Windows machines, they're going to be on Android phones. So I'm wondering whether you know, those people are still using iTunes as well. Yeah, I mean, iTunes is, is, a, is a nightmare and a disaster on PC and exactly. um, it's running second on Mac. Um, I, I, I hope to never use iTunes ever again and just, <laughs> you know, use my iTunes music through my devices. Right. Um, and I, the idea of an Amazon player, like, I just think of all the fun, dumb players that we've seen since the beginning, whether, I mean, Winamp was great, but remember Rhapsody's player back in the day? Right. Like they permanently ruined the Rhapsody brand for me with that Rhapsody player. Um, and uh, I, I'd say more power to Amazon. I hope they make a great player. It's really hard to um, solve everyone's different heterogeneous technological problems with one solution. Yeah. Um, uh, and Steve, uh, it's funny that. Uh, you know, artists seem to always go back to iTunes when it comes to uh, campaigns. You know, we're, we're looking at all the potentially disruptive uh, marketing campaigns for people like Justin Timberlake and a bunch more this year. And really what it came down to was a full stream on iTunes the week before release. Uh, you know, what, what, how do you feel about that? Well, I think that the, uh, I, I, I represent artists. And the genius of Apple, in my opinion, long before the internet, is that these guys always manage to make their products sexier than everybody else's and charge more money for it for years. And they didn't play well with others for years, you know. And But with the artist community, um, they would sell their soul to Apple, yeah. okay? I just went through this the other day, and I won't mention any names, where 
I had to defend us getting 10 grand to, to license some music to Microsoft for their tablet, right? <laughs> um, which I have an iPad, love it, right? But Microsoft spends lots of money and people are buying it, right? And yeah. it was just the Apple thing, which is, I don't want to support, you know, the, my, guys, you're in the business of licensing. Hey, by the way, your friends at Apple are offering this, zero, okay? <laughs> Apple pulls it off, and it's not, it's not an issue of logic or rational stuff, okay? Right. It's just they're good at it. But over time, the more music gets out there, You've seen Samsung take a big bite out of the Apple Sexy this year. I walk around and people are trading out their iPhones for, for you know, the Samsung, right? And God, in my, I'm an older guy. God, in my day, you know, there was a point where made in Japan was a joke and made in Korea was a joke, but it isn't anymore. And uh, so I, I, the, the, the Apple thing, the industry, there are all these people in the music business. They are, they're, they're in love with Apple too, right? Yes. So that's why everything's about Apple. And I'll give you one final cynical thought. I'll, you'll, I'll rival you know, left sets on this. <laughs> the, music, the music industry has this unbelievable penchant for creating their own worst enemies, okay? Yeah. And they keep doing it over and over and over again. And now it's iTunes. They, they, they're, they're the most arrogant pucks over there that you can possibly imagine because now yeah. they are deciding what's cool, and I hate it. That said, <laughs> I'll, like be it, happy, it like I'll be happy States. to go. Well, and then it was MTV, and, and now it's iTunes. Thank well, you. Yeah. Yes. Sounds yes. like United States foreign policy, isn't it? <laughs> no, no. 20 years uh, later. Yeah. <laughs> I'm wondering what artists would do to get some Apple editorial coverage of their you know, album release. Pretty much anything now. Pretty much anything. I'll just, I'll be good now. Yeah, I'll be sure. much anything. <laughs> Full stop. But it, wouldn't, but it wouldn't require money, I'll say that. <laughs> right. No, no, it could be a favors. Yeah. Um, I have a couple points here on this. Um, the, sure. The Amazon, um, I mean, since you're talking about how Apple has always traditionally done business and how that affects the situation, the way that Amazon has always done business, I was just listening to uh, the um, to, to Fresh Air, the NPR thing. I, I have a weakness for that um, on the train sometimes. You know, it's not very rock and roll, but I'll listen to Terry Gross. And uh, she was talking about um, Jeff Bezos and, and example after example. It's kind of like, you know, Amazon has a Walmart-style approach to taking over new businesses. Right. So. Um, what they did with Zappos, um, they saw Zappos making all this money selling shoes online. They started selling shoes for cheaper, just like what they're doing to iTunes, except in that case, it worked. Um, they gutted Zappos' customer base and event and drove them into their into Amazon's arms. So they, they acquired them, and now they operate that. Um, that did not work with music. And I think... You know, not that it's great that you can undercut people and uh, because you're making your money in other markets. I mean, I think that's you know, destroying communities all over the place, which is, you know, we don't need to see it happen online too. But um, I think, you know, to bring this back to your point also about people switching between iPhones and Samsung, um, the fact that lower prices don't drive people to Amazon means that we've got a broken system um, for downloads. If you pay a dollar or a dollar 29 for a song, you should own it on every platform for the rest of your life. Um, and that I've been banging this drum in various ways. I don't know where else I'm going to just keep saying it every time I'm on anything. But uh, I think that that's the number one thing that the industry and the distributors could do to boost sales. And, and to go beyond that, if you create an art, artist station on Pandora, any other streaming radio station, you can bring that artist, you know, at least not the exact programming, because we got to differentiate this, but at least the fact that you've decided to make a station from that artist and so I think this is all about making music portable again. And the fact that prices aren't enough to drive people to Amazon means that there's a problem. And the problem is interoperability. I mean, I think it's one thing when you introduce a new physical format every 20 years. Uh, but it's another when you're talking about formats that people can't even see. Like they're already a little bit nervous about buying it. And now it's like, wait, am I even going to have this? What if I get a Samsung? And that's the problem that needs to be solved. And it's going to require a level of cooperation that we may never see. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think right. that interoperability is a bridge too far. Yeah, but I think unfortunately that's that's the uh, the thing that everybody's waiting for. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No, it's it's a very good point, and uh, I feel like we're going to have to see third party solutions, like we're already starting to see, uh, to try and create that interoperability interoperability between services. And Amazon are trying to do that in their own little 
ecosystem, you know, with the auto rip uh, thing, uh, right. trying to provide that's, that that experience, but uh, it's I, on the limited. They're all doing and... it within their own little ecosystem. Is exactly. exactly. I also have one thought, which is like, what are the economics and the you know the elasticity of demand for something that's a dollar versus eighty four cents or ten dollars versus eight? Um, yeah. If you're buying music, um, which means you have money, I'm not sure that like spending saving sixteen cents for you is worth changing your routine, which is working. Yeah. Um, and we're seeing that. I think that's the best point. People will pay a little bit to keep their cheese where they know where it is. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Cause they spend, you spend a lot of time organizing those libraries. It's a pain in the ass. <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> and then we're you end up like spending a, 50 bucks for whatever is that software that reorganizes yeah, it all for you. Yeah. Tune up, like the cleaner. Yeah. Those. Tune up. That's the one. Yeah. 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 That's, that's right. Uh, well, uh, moving on to the next story, uh, I want to talk about Miley Cyrus. Yay! How fun <laughs> is that? So, uh, we've been talking about it on the show for a little while, and I was kind of quite, I was quite happy when I reported after the VMAs that the massive uh, influx of social media presence of Miley Cyrus in terms of, uh, I think she gained like 400,000 followers in, in just a few days after the VMA thing, uh, hadn't resulted in a, in a big lift uh, in single sales. Actually, she, her lift was much lower than other artists that have prefer, had prefer, had. Prefer performed at the VMAs like Gaga for example uh, but uh, that's all translated into sales for the album because it looks like uh, she has uh, conquered the number one in the UK uh, <coughs> as well as the number one single uh, with Wrecking Ball and she's also uh, heading towards the number one in the US uh, I think confirmed. the charts confirmed okay yeah yes 270,000 copies I want to talk about 270,000 but don't let me interrupt you. Go, yeah, sure and so and so I mean it's it's an interesting thing because you know uh, she's had so much publicity so it's kind of the proof that no publicity is bad publicity and uh, uh, she's kind of turned things around a little bit in the US with the, this the Saturday Night Live gig which uh, was a uh, fairly positively reviewed uh, compared to some of the other stuff that happened uh, she got a huge amount of press from the uh, you know appeals from Sinead O'Connor and Lennox, uh, Amanda Palmer and the like. Uh, so, but it just shows that her approach worked and the f relentless PR campaign around what she, she was doing uh, completely worked. Although the album sales at 270,000 are fairly low for number one. Uh, so I, I don't know. Anybody wants to take that one and, uh, and uh, spin it? I like to jump in there as a manager, right? Yeah. Um, she... She is accomplishing that mission number one, which is how to stand out, right? Yeah. She, she's 20 years old, and with the, at the risk of sounding sexist, she's not going to look this way forever, right? She's in her moment now. And I think that what's now unfolded, first with you know, her, the, the VMA thing, which was, was clearly the start of, we're going to take the, the little bunny or the little Mickey Mouse ears off of Miley Cyrus forever, um, is played out. But the truth is, 30 years ago, this happened with Madonna when she didn't have social media to, to post pictures of herself naked and, and suggestive. She put a book out and it was edgy and it was, uh, you know, it caused great controversy because her initial audience, believe it or not, for Madonna, when I first saw her, was at the Universal Amphitheater and it was all 13 and 14 year old little girls, right? And then she sings a song and she starts, you know, riding on top of this jukebox in a very non-13 or 14-year-old way. And all of a sudden, for me at the time, years ago, I was much younger, I thought, wow, this isn't for 14-year-olds, right? So that idea of using sexuality and, and working at the edge of it is nothing new. You just have new tools to execute it. Today, you can put it on Twitter. Today, you can do it on, on, you know, on your Facebook page. In the old days, you had to count on the media to help you paint that picture. So today, the artists are, are, can get much further out there without having to play to any of the gatekeepers. And that's the big change in the game here, right? What she's doing is no different. And I'll bet you five years from now, if we come back here again, there'll be somebody else that came up with a newer spin on sex cells, edge cells, and if you're a female pop artist, which means you got to you got to maximize your moment, okay? She's this is masterful job, <laughs> if you ask me, it, masterful. But it only sold two hundred seventy thousand records, yeah. um, it, which is low. But she's gotten a gazillion freaking video views, which was a, which is now a source of income for record companies and or artists. If you sign to a label, you got to get paid through them. You're bad, right? If you did it on your own and you got a billion views, that's a big pile of money that if you're a manager, you don't really care what 
column the pile is in, yeah. right, is one that equals a payday, right? Yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of discussion in the music business about what the little line items are and not what the total of it is, you know? So she's winning, and if she goes out on tour where she could probably make five, six hundred grand a night, that's where she'll make her money. Yeah, and she also just pre-sold whatever memoir she eventually writes is going to. I mean, that's automatic bestseller too. <laughs> Absolutely. Slam dunk. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I would jump in here and be like, "We gotta." You know, she came up in the entertainment world. She has some baseline talent, and she worked with mm -hmm. some serious talent, putting out um, bangers. And you know, if, if if she was all sex and and no music. I think things would have been different, but Bangers is doing okay. It's got a 62 meta score with generally favorable reviews. Yeah. Uh, the Entertainment Weekly, which is always you know soft, gave it a 91. Um, like it's an it's an album that has merit and is surviving on its own weight as an album, even without the hype. And the fact that the the hype is so nuclear, um, you know, doesn't surprise me that she's got a number one. I, I there was it is a combination of talent. Uh, tactics and having the goods with bangers. Yeah, right. She's an old pro at 20. She's been doing this forever. <laughs> yeah. I yeah. mean that in the best possible way, Miley, yeah. Miley, if you're out there watching. You know? Absolutely. Elliot, uh, anything to add on this? So what, what do you think about the sales? Well, I mean, I think uh, it's been said here, you know, she got everyone's attention for sure um, over and over again. And I guess, um, you know, I guess that's enough to get the sales going. Um, the one thing uh, I, that I thought was interesting about this is with the Madonna comparison is um, with Madonna, Madonna felt different to me. I mean, I was a lot younger, um, but it seemed like there was something else, some kind of more threatening message going on that I didn't really comprehend, but it was like, I couldn't really, I couldn't really, you know, put Madonna, like I couldn't get her in, inside a box right. in a certain, I don't, I don't think I'm explaining this very well, but no, it I, seems I, know what like, you mean. I see what you mean. Yeah. It seems like that's been lost um, with a lot of people that are trying to pretend to be her is like, I don't even know what her message was, but I know there was one. And I, and I was like a little bit almost intimidated by it. Whereas Miley Cyrus twerking, it's like, okay, that's what that is. You know, there's no, I don't feel uh, any kind of cognitive I, I, I'm not explaining this well. well the bar is so missing. high now. Like I think, I think I'll what you mean is that yeah. take a stab at it. People love watching a fire burn. Thank you. <laughs> and, and whether whether she is a, a controlled burn or she's burning out, it's thrown off heat and everyone's paying attention. Yeah. And the, and for Miley, you know, when you talk about how it all came together, she's a she's a passable singer, great performer. She's loose out there. She knows how to play that game. But if she was really an artist, artist in the context of my frame of reference if she, if she would have written all of those songs on the record herself right that, that publishing still has value out there but but she didn't you know and maybe one day we'll find somebody that, fuck no she didn't she started quote <laughs> writing songs after she became a mega seller and then the manager or the publisher went to the people writing the songs and said, oh, oh, by the way, your, your co-writer is Madger. And if you don't like that, we're going to get some other schmuck and we're going to put them on the record. Because that was when you had big mechanical royalties, big publishing checks for just getting a track on a record that could sell 10 million copies, even if there was only two tracks on the record worth buying. That day, gone. Absolutely. And uh, moving on, I think uh, we just have time for one more story. Um, I'm kind of uh, thinking of what to cover. I mean, one of the big news that came out, uh, um, actually, did not. I'll leave this for next week, actually. It's, it's a very fresh thing. We haven't really addressed it. It's a Telefonica and Rhapsody deal. I think we'll talk about it next week. I wanted to talk about Pandora. So Pandora had a, an interesting interview with CNET this week, uh, uh, which uh, I kind of picked up on a couple of points that uh, were interesting in the sense that Mike Herring sat down with CNET and uh, talked about Pandora's uh, uh, you know, issues in terms of you know, iTunes radio competitivity and uh, uh, other stuff related to artist payments and, and, and all that. So uh, some of the things he said include, you know, we'd like to see artists get paid more. So, you know, great there, you know, artists I'm sure would love to hear that. But then uh, he also said we're uh, the only ones who pay on a per track basis versus a percentage of revenues for satellite radio or zero in broadcast radio. And so he argues that while he's not asking for zero, uh, like broadcast, he'd like to see everybody pay a similarly calculated rate. So this kind of tells me that he wants 
to see artists get paid more, but not by Pandora. He wants to see uh, the other <laughs> radio players step up and start paying for some of the royalties that they haven't paid before or pay more royalties and level the playing field, essentially. So it's kind of like a, you know, giving, giving with one hand and taking back with the other. So uh, I'm wondering whether uh, this feels like it was an attempt to start a, a bridging some of the, the disruptions that have happened with the music industry in the last year with Pandora. There has been a very bad PR for them, uh, all the moves they've done. And so I'm wondering whether that was a first step towards trying to rebuild those bridges. But it doesn't feel like the intention is there. It doesn't They haven't said they're going to stop trying to pay less royalties, essentially. So um, I don't know. How do you take this uh, this interview? And um, uh, what do you feel Pandora's next step is in terms of uh, uh, that fight that they're going through? Elliot, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I mean, I think the core problem is that it's unlike, you know, streaming radio is unlike any other business on the internet. Um, because as you sell as you get more users, your costs go up at the exact same rate. Right. Um, if you do anything else online, you know, your, your costs per unit decline. And, and with Pandora, it, it, it goes right up the more users they have. So I think that's kind of, you know, if, if they can't make that work um, as by far the number one player, um, something might need to shift a little bit. Um, the other thing, the other thing I think is funny is that, uh, or I was joking about the other day is how, you know, if there's, potentially this bill that would make FM radio pay to put it more on par with what Pandora pays because FM radio doesn't pay anything to right. labels and um, recording artists. And my joke is like, well, as, as soon as FM starts paying, you know, everybody's going to complain about what, about those checks, you know, because yeah. right now there are no checks at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's, it's a sticky wicket. I, it, it, the funny thing is when the, when these rates were set, I was writing about it for wired quite a bit and my readership was like overwhelmingly, behind Pandora and save net radio and like, let's give them, um, some kind of royalties that'll, that will at least let them and other people be in this business at all because yeah. people clearly enjoy the product. On the other hand, I think it is more interactive than listening to satellite radio where it's just somebody programming every single track. There's no up and down arrow, um, when you're in a car, at least not yet, there probably will be. Um, anyway, I, I think it's, it's just a, tricky thing and the PR, I think a lot of people arguing about it don't understand what's going on and, and it's just, for sure what we know is like nobody seems happy with the current situation. I think that's no, safe that's to right. say. Absolutely. And it, he made a very good point that, you know, uh, as opposed to other companies that are in the business to sell more devices or to sell music downloads or whatever else that are in the internet radio business, you know, they are in, in it for you know, the music is their main business, you know, they haven't got any side project or anything like that. So, uh, you know, it's a music company and uh, it's important that it works. But uh, how? Uh, Steve, any thoughts on Pandora? Yeah, I think, you know, if, if you buy that, you know, getting your music heard is important, then, then it's good to have people out there that are willing to do that, you know. Um, I just, I, I'm always, I don't know, and I don't have an answer to this, but if, to me where they're, if, if I were giving some advice to Pandora, this argument always gets emotionalized by that the artists are getting screwed. And I say this as an artist representative, but fully conscious of the fact that the tiniest sliver of artists are going to make money in the best scenario. If they were getting 100% of the money you know, for the stream, right? It would be the tiniest sliver. Left Set sent a note out this morning when his Left Set's letter talking about how many pieces of music are out there in the world, right? 807,000 albums in 2011, if I have the numbers right. 13 <laughs> sold a million copies, okay? And I don't know for sure, but I'm guaranteed, I would be willing to bet my house that 13 of them are on big labels that are spending money. So this idea of the artist not getting paid, it gets totally emotionalized. The money's going to the label the artist made a deal with the label, but only the biggest, biggest sellers have ever made money, you know? So I go back to that guy, guy writes a song, does it have any value if nobody hears it, right? right. And that, no, none of these things solve that problem. Pandora, arguably, love them or hate them, Spotify, love them or hate them, are putting music in front of people where artists have a chance to build a career in the music business, however, infinitesimal the chances of that happening are the same way there's a million kids playing basketball one michael jordan one kobe bryant you know it doesn't seem fair but that's the way of the world and uh, i hear all these arguments 
about getting paid and all that stuff, but I keep, from my own experience, the music business is not just selling music, never has been. Right. And that's what gets lost in this. And so this conversation about the artists aren't getting paid, you know, yes, but there's nothing new about that. Getting your music <laughs> heard is important. You'll have to figure out a new way. And I say that as a card carrying member of the old boys club who in some ways is really bummed out that the big piece for young bands today, the ones that get it right, the ones that sell millions, a big chunk of the high side of the business, your record royalties, which no artist ever got record royalties from a record company without suing them, including Incubus, yeah. okay? Yeah. I mean, that's a reality, folks. But if you yeah. choose to make this your living, if you want to make music your living, I don't know which one of you guys said it, but very few moms and dads are going, go out and marry some fucking, you know, wonderfully talented artist or musician uh, and, and, and resign yourself to a life of being really cool. But every time I see that guy on the Sunset Boulevard, he's 50 years old with his freaking Keith Richards belt buckle and his spray on jeans and he's now dying his hair black. I want to go, dude, get a job, man. It's not going to happen for you. And it's, right. you know, so Pandora. You know, I, I like people being able to hear the music, the music, the money side of it. Boy, it's 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 really tricky. Always has been. Yeah, I got I got a lot of thoughts on Pandora. I mean, to me, they're a first mover with a huge brand, and they've replaced radio for a lot of people, especially in businesses. Like businesses just have a Pandora station that they've tuned to their ideal, and they just let that play all day in the background. Right. Um, and iTunes radio costs money, and, and for all the cheapos, Pandora is always going to be their, their default option. As far as the radio or the royalty issues, um, I've researched a lot about this. I wrote a lot about this, and to me, the net radio royalty rates seem punitive, unfair, and there's really no parity between Internet and satellite and, and, and terrestrial, um, and it's totally fucked up, and uh, the terrestrial radio got away with murder back in the day, and Right. And since then, the music industry has just ritually fucked satellite and internet to try to get, you know, to try to prevent what happened with terrestrial. Um, I think um, Pandora's rates need to go down. I think terrestrial radio's rates need to go up. But more importantly, I think the average person's eyes glaze over the second you say royalties and start talking about performance versus mechanical versus publisher versus composer, international, da 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 da. That's they right. just don't care. And this, these efforts to try to marshal the public to one side or the other, I think, are are not going to um, result in the um, idea, like desired outcomes in Washington. Ultimately, I see this as a battle between lobbyists and the groups with the biggest lobbyists and the most amount of lobbyists are going to win at the CRB and in Washington um, with the laws. And so, when I think about that, terrestrial radio has the most money um, comparatively and stands to um, fight off any increases um, and and stands to keep the pressure on internet radio um, and keep keep, it, keep them over a, bit, a barrel for the foreseeable future. And I don't see getting the average music lover and um, let alone the average American to call their congressman about this as opposed to fracking or the debt ceiling or something else. Yeah, or the government be shut down. <laughs> yeah, or, yeah, or pay. Yeah, who are you going to call? <laughs> else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's really the nutshell of it right there is that it, it, at the consumer level, um, I think they just want to hear the music they want to hear. And, and, and everybody's attempt to, to wave the flag of artists is really just a cheap emotional play, which I think goes right over the head of consumers. It was they call it the, the Thievery Corporation come out um, in favor of uh, – um, De defending terrestrial radio rates being low, I think. <laughs> I, I just, I, I don't know. I, I, I just thought for a band well, name. Those rates, yeah, those rates are low, but again, they were, when was it, back in the 1930s? Yeah. You know, back <laughs> think, then, you know, there was, there was no record business. And, and then one more uh, thought, which is that, like, all this pissing and moaning about the, the royalty rates from Spotify and Pandora, I think a lot of it stems from the fact that it's so clear how little, um, or it's so clear where the money's going, whereas in terrestrial, artists have no idea what their actual listenership is on any particular radio station, let alone the like rate terrestrial radio community. The numbers are not broken out or not nearly as clear for them, uh, in, my, in my opinion. Um, it's just not as easy to get a per play, per person um, 
uh, number out of terrestrial the way it's going to be for anything online. And those analytics are spooking people, but they don't have the whole fo- the whole picture. Absolutely. And we talked at length uh, last week or two weeks ago about the proposed uh, potential bill to introduce performance royalties on, on mechanicals for... Um, uh, on the masters for uh, broadcast to a radio, a terrestrial radio in the US. Uh, so we're, we're going to see what happens with that. I don't think much is going to happen, especially given the government situation, uh, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. but uh, <laughs> Yeah, and then you also have, you know, technology lobbyists fighting um, radio lobbyists, and they're both on the sort of left side of the spectrum, and it just right. it just gets all, it just turns into a free-for-all, and, and yeah. they're not, I don't, I don't see movement either way. Yeah, absolutely. Well, guys, it was uh, an absolute pleasure having you on the show. I just want to go through uh, uh, your own projects. Uh, if you have anything to plug or anything you want to talk about, uh, Elliot, starting with you, uh, anything uh, uh, up with you at the moment? Well, I'm just cranking away on Evolver.fm. You know, we're syndicating to a bunch of places. I guess I did want to mention that uh, my mother married a musician, so <laughs> nice. <laughs> somebody yeah. does it. Um, but did he get a real job? No, well, he was a professor at Smith for a little while till he met the grad students, and then that went sideways. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then um, I should also mention my brother's on um, on David Byrne's label. So oh yeah, um, you I mentioned hope, uh, his band last, uh, last yeah, time. Yeah, Javelin. His band's called we Javelin. Should, should... Yeah. Anyway, I hope I hope uh, I hope David, if you see this, that we're still good. You know, and my brother. Uh, let's just keep that out of it. Anyway, <laughs> I want to ask your brother how he feels about his record deal with David Byrne. That would be a great, great question. Get him on. How does David, is David Byrne passing along all that money to the artist? Let's, I'm well, let's betting find no. out. Let's okay. find out, maybe. Yeah, good point. <laughs> and uh, Steve, what about you? I was going to say that uh, for, for folks that are interested in the music business, um, you know, the, what I like to call the real music, not the kind of fairy tale version, I do a little web show, or I have a website called www.renmanmb, is, Renman is my nickname, MB for musicbusiness.com. That's a great where, show. Thank you. And where we're having this conversation about today's music business with, you know, all kinds of people from some of the grizzly old veterans that are, that have been doing great things in the business, you know, with an eye on people that are thinking about the business we live in, not reminiscing. And a whole bunch of new people, people like yourselves that are that are looking at the music business through today's filter with with none of the baggage and perhaps none of the the experience of some of the things that have worked in the past that still work. And so if, if you're a music lover, if you're a musician, if you're an artist, you know, aspiring artist, music professional, um, I think it's a great place for you to learn, and there will be no student loans due at the end of it. Um, so you can even you can even have your dad watch it with no fear of having to <laughs> support a musician. That's great, and absolutely. I can sponsor it. You know, you get some free subscriptions. Yeah, uh, and, uh, and, I, would, I would love to have a sponsor. Yeah, yeah. And definitely, I'll, I'll add the, the links to the the friends of DMT as well on the site so that people know know where to go and it's a it's a fantastic right. show so uh, absolutely tune in uh, David uh, last word to you uh, anything you want to plug yeah well I just first of all I wanted to say Elliot thanks for all your great work at Evolver I'm a heavy reader every day oh. I just stand in awe of what you do over there so keep up the awesomeness absolutely um, Steve thanks. Incubus was a cornerstone of my childhood thanks for uh, managing them so well uh, <laughs> well thank you well I'll, I'll say that most of it was them I just try to stay out of the way <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to c- continue to do um, cover the electronic music scene in San Francisco for the San Francisco Examiner every week right. and uh, and review music apps for Billboard magazine, which I do about every other week. I'm also a freelancer here in San Francisco covering art and technology for places like Wired and Rolling Stone. So if anybody has any story ideas or assignments, I'm always ears. I'm all, always open. So uh, send me an email at david.downs, D-O-W-N is in Nancy, S is in Sam at gmail.com that's great thanks so much and thank you guys for joining me it was an absolute pleasure having you all on it was a great show and uh, thanks so much for listening Uh, Digital Music Trends is available on a variety of channels as I mentioned at the beginning you can find it anywhere uh, so there's no reason not to tune in and uh, uh, my email is uh, contact at digitalmusictrends.com you can find me on Twitter on at digimusictrends I'm going to throw all the uh, Twitter links of course to all the guys that were on the show today Uh, and uh, thanks so much for tuning in have a great week and until next time and that's all for this week. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Check out digitalmusictrends.com and sign up to the weekly newsletter.